in this section, I will go back in time to the beginning of the 7th century BCE in order to expand a bit on the background of the campaigns of the kings of Assyria, Esarchadon and Ashurbanipal, to Egypt and the establishment of the 26th Egyptian dynasty. I will try to clarify the nature of the connection between Assyria and Egypt in the second half of the 7th century BCE, and I will end in a few minutes describing the clash between Egypt and Babylon after the final disappearance of the Assyrians. The, 20th, the 26th Egyptian dynasty, the so-called Said dynasty, was established by the Assyrian kings Esarchadon and Ashurbanipal as a counterweight to the 25th dynasty, the so-called Kushai dynasty, that controlled all of Egypt at that time. Already in Esarchadon's first successful campaign into Egypt in 671 BCE, he succeeded in surprising Taharqa, the Kushite. Although Taharqa and his army managed to take up positions against him, Esarchadon defeated him, perhaps even several defeats. The Egyptian ruler was forced to retreat to Memphis, which he had no time to fortify and fell after a short battle. Taharqa fled southward to Tebes, Noamun, leaving behind his family and wealth, Esarchadon tried to establish his rule in Lower Egypt based on Assyrian officials and garrisons that worked with the local rulers, some of whom were replaced, others were reappointed. Among, among those whose status was approved was Necho I, the ruler of Sais. He ruled between 671 and 664 BCE. A short time after the Assyrian army left Egypt, Taharqa returned and took Memphis, making an attempt to re-establish his rule in the Delta region. The Assyrian campaign against Taharqa in 669 BCE was halted in the land of Israel due to the illness and death of Esarchadon. However, his son Ashurbanipal ascended the throne and quickly set out for Egypt in 667 or 666 BCE. This time too, the Assyrian army had a resounding victory over the Kushites. Taharqa was again forced to flee from Memphis, southward, apparently to Tebes, and perhaps even farther south to Napata. According to Assyrian sources, Ashurbanipal returned the local rulers who had been appointed by his father, and among these, he approved the rule of Necho I as an Assyrian vassal. Nonetheless, even after this campaign, the Assyrians were unsuccessful unsuccess in establishing the rule in Egypt, and a short time after the armies departed, many of the local rulers joined with Taharqa and prepared for revolt. The plot was discovered and cruelly suppressed. When the reasons are known, Ashurbanipal decided to release Necho I and to return him to Sais as his appointed sover sovereign. Psametichus, his son, was given an Assyrian name, Nabu Shezibani, and he was appointed as the prince of Atribis. Without any intention of doing so, by this act, Ashurbanipal established the 26th Sa'it Egyptian dynasty. The destiny of this dynasty was to reunite Egypt after a long period of decline and to have an important impact on the history of Assyria and the kingdoms and provinces in Syria and in the land of Israel. Even after these arrangements, Assyria's, Assyrian rule in Egypt didn't achieve stability, and again, after a brief period, Memphis was retaken by the cousin and heir of Taharqa and the last king of the Kushai dynasty, Tanwe Tamun, who ruled between 664 and 656 BCE. Necho I honored the treaty he had made with Ashurbanipal, standing at forefront of the opposition to the Kushite conquest and was apparently killed for that reason. It is possible that his son Psamitichus, Nabu Shizibani, fled north and returned to Egypt with the Assyrian army, which came very quickly to re-establish Assyrian rule in Egypt for the third time. On the second campaign of Ashurbanipal to Egypt in 664 or 663 BCE, 
His army pursued Tanwetamun to Tebes, and after he fled south to Nubia, the Assyrians conquered the city and carried off its treasures to Assyria. This campaign led to the end of the 25th dynasty in Egypt, and Tanwetamun never left Nubia again. After the conclusion of the Assyrian campaign, Psamitichus I succeeded his father and ruled for 54 years, 664 to 610 BCE. Politically, there were few changes at this time in Lower Egypt, at a time when the other rulers of the Delta continued to preserve their rule over their own territories. We have no information about the activities of Psamitichus at the beginning of his rule, but within a few years, apparently by 658 BCE, he succeeded in firmly establishing his rule throughout the Delta region. He was aided by mercenaries from Asia Minor and Western Anatolia, perhaps supported by the king of Lydia and apparently also by Assyria. There is no information available on the battles Psamitichus conducted against the rest of the Delta rulers. It would seem that continued political and military pressure, perhaps together with focused military actions, are what succeeded in establishing his rule and obtaining the recognition of the other rulers. Two years later, Psamitichus also established his rule over Upper Egypt. Theban rulers recognized Psamitichus' actual rule, and at this point, Upper and Lower Egypt were reunited, opening a new chapter in Egyptian history. During this time, Psamitichus has enough power and confidence to cease paying tribute to Assyria and to transform himself from a protected subject to an independent king. Despite this, he apparently remained a loyal ally to Assyria, and there is no evidence of any hostility between the two kingdoms. When Assyria withdrew from Syria and the land of Israel 20 years later, in the beginning of the third decade of the 7th century BCE, Egypt easily established its rule there. Within several years, Egypt stabilized its border on the Euphrates and, as we discussed in the previous unit of this course, in 616 BCE, Psamitichus I set out from there to help Assyria in the war against Babylon and the Medes. He had a real interest in helping the Assyrian king Sinshar Ishkun withstand the unending onslaught of its rivals from east and south. As long as Assyria continued to exist, even as a kingdom gradually losing its territorial holdings, among them its major cities, Egypt could establish its rule in the area west of the Euphrates without exposing itself to direct confrontation with a powerful Medes Babylonian army. Nonetheless, there is only one known instance of Egypt helping Assyria during the time of Psamitichus I, and this is in 616 BCE, and even that aid was limited in scope and insignificant in terms of its consequences. It was only when Nehor II ascended the throne in 610 BCE that Egyptian policy changed. In addition to the campaigns conducted by the young king in an effort to assist Assyria in its last war of survival, 610 and 609 BCE, he intensified his effort to establish his reign and status in northern Syria and on the western banks of the Euphrates. The Egyptian action also included attempts to establish a foothold east of the Euphrates, apparently as a first step towards an offensive into Mesopotamia. However, at this stage, the Egyptians encountered a Babylonian opponent, superior in strength, which under Nebuchadnezzar leadership was prepared to take over Syria and the land of Israel within a few years. Thus, it would seem that from the Egyptian perspective, the year 609 BCE was a starting point for a frontal struggle against Babylon. Egypt had established itself as an empire throughout the region of Syria and the land of Israel to the Euphrates, although its presence was particularly felt in the regions laying along the Mediterranean coast. The border between the two empires was temporary, 
if Egypt were to emerge victorious, it could expand its rule beyond the Euphrates and even pose a threat to Babylonia itself. If Egypt lost, the Babylonians would break through to Syria and the land of Israel, and from there they, too, could constitute a threat to Egypt itself. The Egyptians ruled over Syria and the land of Israel for a quarter of a century, from the Assyrian retreat around 630 BCE, until the decisive Babylonian victories after which Egypt was pushed out of its foothold in Asia, 605-604 BCE. There are few accounts left from this period from which we learn that the Egyptians aspired to establish a stable government in the entire region and acted to accomplish this in a variety of ways, both politically and militarily. Egypt had two major reasons for establishing its rule in the region of Syria and the land of Israel. From the economic point of view, Egypt's major interest in the Levant was in Phoenicia. The economic importance of the ports and the sea that would was great. And considering this, it is clear why Egypt established its rule first and foremost on the Phoenician coast between Tyre and Arvad. Psamitichus I owned land in Lebanon mountains, perhaps a royal estate, where his officials supervised the transportation of cedar trees to Egypt. The Egyptians also assigned great importance to the Via Maris, the road along the Mediterranean coast, which made land commerce possible among Egypt, the land of Israel, and Syria. It also seemed that the wine and oil from the land of Israel were of great importance to Egypt's economy. From the strategic point of view, after the disappearance of Assyria, Egypt was left with no choice. Its border was positioned on the Euphrates River, and that was where direct conflict began with the Babylonians. At this stage, it was clear to both sides that this was a provisional border. They both tried to establish footholds on the other side of the river as a base for a future offensive. At this point, Egypt had two spheres of strategic interest. The immediate sphere of interest included primarily Philistia, which was perceived as Egypt's immediate security zone. This area was the one overland gateway to Egypt from the north and served as a crucial foothold for anyone interested in crossing the desert and invading the hinterland. This required the Egyptians to entrain themselves in the region as well as to maintain tight control throughout the Via Maris leading northward. This was the major and, in fact, the only artery of traffic for anyone who wished to move troops in the direction of Egypt, and it seemed that it had great importance to transferring Egyptian troops to the other side of the Euphrates, as did the ports along it. It is with this in mind that one may understand the Egyptian fortress that was at Mitzad Hashavyahu and the evidence of the presence of mercenary soldiers found at Stratum 8b at Yavne Yam, as well as at Ashkelon, Ekron, and Timna. The remote sphere of interest, including North Syria up to the west bank of the Euphrates. We already mentioned that the importance of this region was not great as long as Assyria continued to exist even as a diminished kingdom. However, with its disappearance, the Euphrates became Egypt's first line of defense against Babylonian invasion attempts. It was a strategic importance in preventing the establishment of Babylonian outposts on the western side of the Euphrates as a springboard for a large overland offensive into Syria. This area also could serve as a springboard for a future attack launched by Egypt beyond the Euphrates. Depending on the ability of the Egyptian army to establish bridgeheads east of the Euphrates and under cover of these bridgeheads to deliver massive forces that could cross the river. In accordance with these economic and strategic interests, one may understand the military steps taken by Egypt and the characteristics of its rule in the region.
Egypt governed this area for more than 20 years until Babylonian took control in 605 and 604 BCE. And for most of this time period, up to at least 610 BCE, Psammetichus I was the ruler. In this short period, for which there is scant historical documentation, it is possible that the Egyptians established their foothold in Philistia immediately upon the Assyrian army's retreat. According to the account preserved in the description of Herodotus, the Egyptians laid siege to Ashdod for 29 years until they captured the city. There is no information about the other Philistine coastal cities. However, one may conjecture that over the long years of the Pax Assyriaca, they maintained close ties with Egypt and that they were the first to recognize its status as a successor state. In any event, the establishment of Egyptian rule in Philistia was rapid, and the Philistine city-states continued to pledge fealty to Egypt even in the early years of the Babylonian rule in the region. At a fairly early stage of Egyptian rule of the region, Egypt established itself up to Phoenicia, subjugating Tyre and apparently Arvad as well. Tyre was restored at this point to its status as a vassal city-state. It is not clear to what extent Egypt was interested in the hinterland or what effort it invested in establishing its rule there. Nevertheless, the biblical account attests to Egypt's intention of establishing its rule throughout the entire area. According to the second book of Kings, chapter 23, verse 29, Neho came to Megiddo on his way to assist Assyria, and he killed King Josiah there. I'm reading. Be'amav, ala paro Neho melech Mitzrayim al melech Ashur al nehar prat, v'yelech ha-melech Yoshiao likrato, v'yamitehu b'mgiddo kiroto oto. Later on, Neho deposed Yehoachaz from the throne and appointed Eliakim Jehoiakim, and on this we can read in verses 33 and 34. In light of the analysis of the international events and the biblical accounts, it seemed that at this stage Judah was overshadowed by Egypt. Thus, Judah could not conduct an independent foreign policy of its own, certainly not in the lowland, the coastal region, and the Jezreel Valley. There is no information available about any other arrangements the Egyptians made, but it is reasonable to assume that at this point in time, it was important for them to firmly establish the rule in Syria in preparation for the struggle against the Babylonians in the area of the Euphrates. From the Egyptian center in Rivla, they began the arrangements that enabled them to establish themselves in central Syria and the southward. There is no information about parallel arrangements by the Egyptians in northern Syria. However, the military ventures they initiated there between the years 608 to 605 BCE are evidence of the great importance they attributed to this region as their starting base for campaigns against the Babylonians from both sides of the Euphrates. Mm -hmm.